I noticed that there are not a lot of left brain thinkers here. There are quite a few right brain thinkers, maybe some psychics and some weirdos. It's an interesting group of people. I want you to know that I say that because I would also like to let you know that I understand what it's like to be different. When I was a child, I didn't know that I was psychic. I knew that I was strange. My parents made sure that I knew that. My father is a Southern Baptist minister. And I used to talk about the lights that I saw around people and the colors. And that made Dad nervous. I didn't know that they didn't see it. I thought we just weren't supposed to talk about it. It was rude or something. When I went to school, I didn't like to read. It hurt my head to read. So I carried my books in front of me on my tummy all semester. By the time the test came up, I had absorbed enough to pass the test. My parents knew that and they didn't like it. When I was 14, I demonstrated that ability for another young man in our class. And he told somebody else and he told somebody else and the principal called my mother to school and said, we don't know what he's doing, but we know it's upsetting the other kids. So mother took me home that night and sat me down and, and said, your father and I have known for a long time that you have these abilities. And she said, if you were using these abilities to help people, we could believe that they are of God. And she stopped right there. What I heard her saying is, these things are of the devil. And I thought I might be the Antichrist, so I tried to kill myself that night. And I still carried scars. Sorry about that. <laughs> when I look into the faces of people who have any depth of spirituality or experience, I see something in those faces that my bonsai master used to call character. By character, he was referring to a little tree that had become gnarled and had all sorts of lines and twists. And the more it had, the more character the tree had. You could say even that these things that were in the miniaturized trees were sort of ugly, but they weren't really ugly. They added to the interest of the tree. I think of that when I look into the faces of people who have been different, people who have been hurt, have been lonely, their faces take on interesting character. And you know that there is a great well of deep sharing that's available there. And too many times in our society, we haven't allowed people to express that. I have a feeling that that's why we're here today. We really want to share the depth of a loving heart, the magic of a loving heart. And in most cases, we need permission to do that. That's what this conference is for, it's permission. To open up that heart, make yourself vulnerable, and share with other people that are here. The magic of a loving heart is involved in communications, and in healing. In fact, I'd like to share this with you about healing. This is how I learned a lot about the magic of a healing heart. There's a verse of scripture that says in the New Testament, greater love hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for another. I heard that scripture plenty of times when I was a kid. But as I grew up and as I began to work, with developing my spiritual abilities, my psychic abilities. I studied with a master. 
And interestingly, his young son, 14 years old, became critically ill with cancer. And I wanted more than anything in the world to help this child, to help him to be healed. So I went to where he was at Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Center in New York. And I took his hands and I tried to do everything that I could to give him healing energy. But it felt like there was a brick wall, a barrier. It wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't receiving it. I had been taught, I've heard several times from different teachers, if you're going to try to be a healer, you need to protect yourself. Don't take on the symptoms of the person you're trying to heal. And I was trying to do that. I was trying to protect myself. And I ask, I listened inside and I ask God, what's wrong? Why isn't this healing working? And what I heard was that little verse of scripture that I just gave you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for a friend. So I said to Ben, are you afraid that I will catch your cancer? And he started to cry and he said, yes. I know it's not contagious, but if it happened to you, I couldn't stand it. I said, Ben, let me have it. If I can take it into me, I can also get rid of it. If God is powerful enough to transfer that disease from you to me, then he's powerful enough to get rid of it in me. So I said, let me have it. And he did. And I fell to the floor. And while I was on the floor, trying to think about what's going on, this power that had just hit me and knocked me down, there was something that started way down in me, like bubbles in a 7-Up. And I started to laugh. And I got hysterical with laughing. It was the funniest thing, the most exciting experience that I'd ever had. It just kept pouring out. And of course, with all this laughing in a cancer ward in the hospital, it attracted some attention. Ben's father and the doctor came rushing in and rushed me out. I was still laughing on the way down the elevator and out to the street. I couldn't stop. And it let me realize how much power, how much magic it takes to create an illness. I didn't get Ben's cancer. I did get the energy required to make a cancer. But that isn't what I chose to do with it. And I'm very much convinced that if I hadn't meant what I said to Ben, if I hadn't been willing to take that from him, it couldn't have happened that way. Ben got out of the hospital that week and went back to school. I say, we're crippled until we can love each other with that kind of love that is unconditional, that cares what's happening in you. And until we get conscious enough, until we get concerned enough, alive enough, to share that kind of energy, we're going to have the problems that we have on the planet. Let me give you just a couple of ideas. There was a time several years ago when somebody from a security agency of the United States got in touch with me and said, we're testing psychics to see if they can pick up what's in the file folders of some Soviet missions. And I thought about whether I wanted to do that or not, and I prayed about it. I asked God. The answer that I got was this. If you want to know what is in the Soviet Union's file folders, you're going to have to care. Because that's the only way to know. And if you get caring enough to pick up that information psychically, you will no longer be enemies. So I recommend that we all start trying to see what's in the Soviet Union's file folders. <laughs> Try to see what is in the heart of those people. I'm convinced that when we begin to know that every single person on this planet, four and a half billion of us, have bodies that need love literally to survive. 
It's something that you've got to have. It's a survival need. If you don't get it, you can die from the lack of it. You need love. And we've all been taught it's not nice to love yourself. That's egotistical. You have to get somebody else to love you. And that makes quite a problem. Because if I don't love myself, and you do, there must be something wrong with you. There must be something wrong with your values to love me when I don't. Four and a half billion people have bodies. Each one has one. Each one of those bodies needs love in order to survive. Guess whose responsibility this body is? It ain't yours. And that doesn't mean that I, want your, that I don't want your love. I do. I really would like to have every one of you love me. I'd like to have that energy. And I want you to notice that I'm talking about love as an energy, not as an emotion, but an energy that is transferable from one person to another. I'd like for you to all love me. But if you don't, it's all right. I am loved. I love me. And I intend to continue. I will love me whether you do or not. I want to tell you something else. I'm going to love you whether you like it or not. Every one of you. And I'm not playing when I say that. I mean it. From the bottom of my heart, I mean it. There are not going to be any people in my life who are not loved. I won't allow it. It's just not going to happen. I know that if I'm going to have to interact with you on any level, any level, I want to be sure that what I'm feeling toward you is love. In recent tests, it's been discovered that one of the ways to be psychic in a communication with another person is to mimic their facial expressions. While you're watching them talk, mimic the facial expression and you will hear what they're thinking and what they're feeling. But in order to do that, we have to change something in our relationships. What happens in relationships right now is when people come up and meet each other, when you're introduced to somebody, there's a little bit of fear in there and you're standing there thinking, gee, I wonder if my hair's straight. I wonder what he's thinking about me. And all of that time that you're concerned about what he's thinking about you, I can tell you what he's thinking about you. What he's thinking is, I wonder what she's thinking about me. That's what's uh, going on in the other head. So you might as well just know that. It doesn't have anything to do with you. They're trying to get love just as you're trying to get love. And if, in that situation, you care enough to watch that face, if you care enough to want to know what that person is thinking, then you're going to be psychic and you're going to be loving. Let me tell you how that works. Right now, while we're talking, if I want to know what you're thinking, it's very easy, really. The only thing that I have to do to know what you're thinking is to care more what you're thinking than what I'm thinking. And if I can care more what you're thinking than what I'm thinking, I will drop my thoughts and listen to yours. And it will be an extraordinary communication. The same thing is what is necessary for healing. The power, the magic of a loving heart is what will allow you to take symptoms from another and give, give them the power of love without endangering yourself. But I do want to warn you, don't ever agree to take someone's symptoms unless you're really willing to do so. And if you're really willing to do so, you won't have to. If you say it and don't mean it, I'm not responsible. But if you love enough to feel someone else's pain, to feel their symptoms, to care what's going on with them, 
you have the power of telepathy. You have the power of healing. I want to tell you just a little further what happened with me. I sort of dropped you off when I was 14 years old. After that nightmare episode, I did my best for the next few years to avoid admitting, even to myself, that I was having these psychic experiences. I still saw the lights and things, but I didn't, I didn't admit that I saw them, and I didn't interpret them, and I didn't work with them. And because I had believed what I was told, give your heart to God, give your life to God, I did. I went to seminary. I bet you wondered where all these Baptist preachers come from. It works sort of like this. When you're a child, you're taught that there's a God, very personal God, that you can talk with. And God is always there, every minute, watching over your shoulder, which is wonderful until you reach puberty. <laughs> I used to take the picture of Jesus in my bedroom and turn it around toward the wall. <laughs> and I always promised to quit. And then I spent a lot of time apologizing. So I went to seminary to see if I could get straight with myself and with God. I went to seminary, got married, had a little girl. And just after my daughter was born, my wife fell in love with somebody else and left. And that day I became a member of an extinct species, a divorced Southern Baptist minister. So I didn't know what to do with, uh, you know, three years of teaching you how to make people feel guilty. So I went to work in bars and nightclubs. And I got really mad at God. I got really mad with God. I got so mad that I went out and bought a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> Smoked them all, got very sick. And then I had a beer. The first time I'd ever tasted beer in my life. And I had some more and some more. And then I went to sex and then to drugs. And for the next 10 years, I did anything that I could find out about. If I didn't do it, it's because I didn't hear about it. <laughs> and that's a way to create for yourself an experience that is sometimes called the dark night of the soul. You go far enough to get desperate enough till the energy gets black and deep and you can't handle it yourself and you have to cry out, somebody help me. I got to that point and I knew that I didn't want to talk to God. I didn't want to talk to my dad. Anything about prayer and church, I'd had all that. And I didn't want to go and see a psychiatrist either. And so I wondered, what else is there? And then I thought, what about hypnotherapy? I'll get a hypnotist to tell me that I feel better about myself, and that'll do it. So I looked up a hypnosis clinic in the Yellow Pages. And I went, and they designed this wonderful program. It sounded just exactly what I need. And then they told me the cost and made my depression worse. <laughs> that night, I ran into a young man who said, one of the customers in my bar, he said, I hypnotized somebody once. And I said, that's good enough. Let's go do it. <laughs> went home, laid down, and he started this boring hypnosis routine. I mean, it was boring. The only way I could escape it is to go to sleep. And I did. Woke up a little while later, and he was jumping up and down with excitement and said, we talked with spirits. And I said, what do you mean? And he described this voice that had come from me, giving him all the spiritual information. And I thought, that's all my years in seminary, coming from my subconscious mind to the surface. I really wasn't interested. And I got rid of him, but he kept coming back. He would come back every day, and he said, Finally, he got me on this one. He said, I know that wasn't you, because you're not that smart. <laughs> that convinced me to try it one more time and record it to see what this voice was all about. And the voice that we talked to in that communication said, we're not spirits, personalities, somebody other than you. What you have tapped into is the rest of your own mind. 
what you have used all your life is such a tiny portion of your mind and through this experience you've opened your consciousness to the rest of your mind and they went on to try to explain to us what that energy was what that level was that we tapped into and we asked a couple of questions we we had prepared ourselves with a couple of questions to talk to this voice and sort out what it really was and so we had silly little questions like what is your name what is it like where you live and uh, and finally the hypnotist asked is there any way that I can do this too and the source in that communication said, yes, there are ways to learn to do this. Anyone can do it too. Everybody has a rest of their mind or a superconscious mind. And all you have to do is teach them to turn their attention to that instead of the voices of the senses. And they mentioned that someone else had had a similar experience, somebody named Edgar Casey. They told us to write to the ARE. And then they gave us the... Uh, the box number, the zip code, and the price of the books. <laughs> I'd never heard of Edgar Casey, But we wrote, wrote away for the books, and when the books came, we discovered something brand new, a concept called a mystery school and initiates. I was so determined to find a mystery school where I could study, like these big stars throughout history have studied, masters training them, I was looking all over for a mystery school. And an interesting thing happened. There was a little girl who was lost in our apartment complex, and everybody was looking for her. We were all out looking for her, and the police came. And the hypnotist went up to the police and was pointing at me, and I knew what they were up to, so I tried to get away, but I didn't. This police officer sat me down, and he said, listen, I want you to close your eyes and go into whatever kind of state it is that you go into and see if you can see this little girl. So I closed my eyes, I tried to attune, and I said, well, I've got an image, but I don't know if it's right or not. It feels like I'm just making it up. He said, never mind, tell me. So I said, I see a little girl hiding under a bed and she's crying. He said, come out from under the bed and describe the room to me. So I got an image said to him again, I feel like I'm just making it up. I don't know what's going on. He said, never mind, describe the room to me. So I did. Then he said, come out of that room into the front of the building. Tell me what the building looks like. I did. He took me down to the corner and said, tell me what this says on the street corner sign. I told him and he left with me still in this unconscious state and found the little girl. And the reason I tell you about that experience is because her mother came back to me several months later, and she said, there's someone that I want you to meet. He's a Zen master. And I thought, that sounds really neat. And she told me that he works with bonsai. I didn't know what bonsai was, so she explained it's the Japanese art of miniaturizing trees. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So we took a drive out. Went to the outskirts of Atlanta, way back into the country on dirt roads. And I thought, this guy is not a very good uh, public relations head. Nobody can find him out here. He ought to have a sign on the street and an ad in the yellow pages. I was going to tell him all about that when I got there. But we kept going deeper and deeper into the woods, found this little house with this little old man. And I'm telling you, that man moved more slowly than I've ever seen anybody move. Every movement was like going through molasses, so slow. And the slower he went, the more uptight I got. I was jumping in to, to finish his sentences. I, I had to have something going on. And then all of a sudden, I thought, this guy is really making a mockery of me. The faster I get, the slower he gets. There's something going on here. So I began to think about what this was, what kind of game he was trying to play. And a, a man came to the door, a doctor, with a patient. And I heard this doctor say to the bonsai master, I don't know if anyone else can help but you. So they brought this little old man in who really looked like death itself. He really looked pathetic. And the teacher put him in the corner of the room, mixing soils. And he would take this little scoop, 
I very slowly take some out of one and put it into the other and out of the other and put it into this one. And it felt terrible. All of us in the room sort of went depressed with his energy. I mean, there you are in the room trying to work with your little trees while somebody's dying over in the corner. That's just what it felt like. So while this is going on, I was observing the people with their little trees, and I saw this girl take a huge pair of snippers and start to take a limb off a tree. And I heard, I heard the teacher's voice say, what are you doing? But at the same time I heard that, I noticed that his hand was on her hand and had prevented the cut. What I'm telling you is he moved across the room faster than I could see. I didn't see him leave that place and come to this place. I just saw him in this place that quick. That's the same guy who had been moving like he was moving through molasses. So I'm beginning to think a little more. There's something going on here. And a couple of other things happened that, he, that I could see that he was explaining spiritual principles. And suddenly this old man over in the corner that was so sick, instead of scooping slowly these soils from one to the other, he suddenly began to cry and he screamed and he threw dirt all over the room and it was showering down and he went on and on and on screaming and crying and throwing dirt and all of us were sitting there looking at the master thinking aren't you going to do something and he didn't and finally the old man just sort of collapsed into a sob and got really quiet and went back to working with the soils again but he no longer felt like a dying man he was a man who had found something that he hadn't found all his life. And what he found in that moment was, as he described it to me, something like this. In fact, it was the same thing that I found in my awakening. That is, he found out that although nobody else in the world loved him, he swore that neither his wife nor his children nor business partners, he said, there's nobody in this world who loves me. But he said, I've just found out that it's all right for me to love myself. For me, that came this way. I was aware over the years that if I had somebody I was in love with, I would be successful for them. But if I was alone, I wasn't in love and I had nobody to be successful for, I wasn't successful. So I went up and down from peaks to valleys and then I finally realized it's all right to be successful for me. I would like for you to get that, to realize that with all these four and a half billion bodies on this planet that need love, the only one you're responsible for is yours. And if you want to get love from some other people, that's fine to ask for it. It's, it's fine to receive it. What is not fine is for you to make it their responsibility. They can't handle it. Even if you're married, that other person can't handle it. There are going to be times when they don't feel like feeding your need to be loved. It's your responsibility. It's your body. It's your mind. It's your life. And the reason I think it is important is this. For as long as we have unloved people on this planet, we're going to have crime and war and danger. People who don't love themselves are dangerous people. Because they will do anything in the world, anything, to get acceptance and love. There's no limit. It's where crime comes from. People who don't have a sense of self-worth, they have to get attention somehow. Haven't you noticed that in children? Children will get your attention by doing rotten things. And if they grow up in that head, they're going to continue to do things to get attention. It's a love substitute. Two things I want to leave you with. You have all of the love that you need if you're willing to give it to yourself. There is nobody else responsible on this planet for loving you, and however much you might want to protest that. My parents should love me, my wife should love me, my children should love me. Never mind what should be. As long as you're believing what should be, you are simply shooting on yourself and that's all you'll get out of it. If you are willing to accept your responsibility for giving yourself the love that you need, something else will happen. What will happen is 
that when you feel loved, you will feel all right. That means whole. That means healed. It means all right with yourself. It doesn't mean that you're going to be egotistical. Egotistical people are not people who have found self-love. They are people who desperately need love, and they do egotistical things to try to get it. Loving yourself will not make you egotistical. It will make you all right. It will allow you to handle the responsibility for being all right without putting it on somebody else. And one more thing it will allow you to do. It will allow you to love other people without putting conditions on that love. You'll drop the ifs. And when you meet somebody, instead of standing there thinking, I wonder what he's thinking about me, you'll be standing there thinking, I would like you to love me, but if you don't, it's all right. I am loved. When you get that kind of confidence, an interesting thing will happen. People who never loved you before are going to wake up and see something in you called charisma. They will be drawn to you to try to figure out what's happened suddenly in your life. They will come for the love that you have to give, and if you give it freely, don't be afraid to give it. Then that person will be a product of your love, a part of your love, and will begin to give it back to you. Don't be afraid. There are only two forces in this world. And this is straight from Gary Keller's book. He has a book here at the conference called Love and Fear, The Great Conspiracy. And the idea is that there are only two energies available on Earth, and every thought, every thought that you will ever think, every action you will ever do is motivated by one or the other of these two energies, either by love or by fear. Think about it and see if your thoughts are motivated by fear. Because every one of your thoughts that is motivated by fear is destructive. It can build disease in your body. How many of the cells that you have made in your body were built in a moment of your life that was pure joy? All of the other cells in your body are potential hazards. Now let me try to say that again. While you're thinking, anytime, all the time, while you're thinking, you are making cells in your body. And every one of those cells that is built in your body at a time of perfect peace, at a time of joy and love, are healthy cells in your body, and they're wonderful. They'll even make you look better. I wasn't always this good looking. <laughs> couldn't help that. Every one of the cells in your body that was created in a joyous moment is a happy, joyous, healthy cell in your body. The rest of them are opportunities for disaster, and you need to start making your body over again. Healing the cells, building a body that is made of joy and love and light with the power of the loving heart to empower other people to build the society that we need. And it's been described by wise men over the ages as a time, a new age, when there will be peace on earth. When the new Jerusalem will descend. When there will be no need for a sun in the sky because the presence of God will light the earth. It's time. It's time for the second coming. It's time to receive God. It's time to enter heaven, and it's your opportunity to live in heaven. If you are willing to love unconditionally, you get the opportunity to live in heaven. And everybody else can be in hell if they want to. And they may not even believe that you're existing in heaven. That's all right, it doesn't require their belief. When you love unconditionally, you step into the kingdom called heaven, and you take yourself out of the place of fear called hell. And I invite you to make that change. Thank you for letting me share with you.